Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tobacco Cessation Counseling Training Conference Call. Your host for today, Julie Campbell. You may now begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presented by Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. Lake Superior Quinn is comprised of three organizations, MCRO in Michigan, Metastar in Wisconsin, and Stratus Health in Minnesota, to support the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services priorities for healthcare quality improvement in each organization's respective state. Today's webinar slides will be available on the Lake Superior Quinn YouTube page within the next week. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Paige to get us started. Hi, everyone. So today we are going to understand what works to motivate tobacco cessation, discuss motivational interviewing techniques, and learn about programming and support for patients who are trying to quit. First, let's take a look at some statistics. So the above map from the CDC reflects 2015 data compared to 2016. If we take a look at the map, um, Michigan approximately 20 to 23.6% of adults reported being current cigarette smokers. In Wisconsin, 16 to about 21%. And in Minnesota, 12 to 16% were current cigarette smokers. Over the last decade, current smoking has declined from about 21 in every 100 adults, so that is approximately 20.9%, to about 15 in every 100 adults, which is 15.1%, from 2015, I'm sorry, from 2005 to 2015. However, cigarette smoking is still prevalent in certain populations, including males, young adults, below poverty level, and certain races and ethnicities. Smoking leads to disease, disability, and harms nearly every organ of the body, and it is the leading cause of preventable death. Diseases and conditions associated with smoking include asthma, stroke, Berger's disease, vision loss, gum disease, heart disease, cancer, and COPD. Cigarette smoking is also the strongest independent risk factor for pneumococcal disease. That's why it's important for adults to receive a pneumococcal vaccination. It is recommended that adults aged 19 to 64 who smoke receive one dose of the PTSD-23 vaccine. And for adults 65 and up, the PCV-13 vaccine is recommended first, and then the PTSD-23 vaccine should be given at least once a year later after receiving the PCV-13 vaccination. Also, if we look at the table under patient population, for the age group 19 to 64, the certain chronic conditions include chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, alcoholism, chronic liver disease, in addition to current smokers. There is no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke causes numerous health problems in infants and in children, including more frequent and severe asthma attacks, respiratory infections, ear infections, and sudden infant death syndrome. Also, smoking during pregnancy results in more than 1,000 infant deaths annually. Some of the health conditions caused by secondhand smoke in adults, in adults include coronary heart disease, stroke, and also lung cancer. Approximately 25 of adults in the U.S. have some form of mental illness or substance abuse disorder, and these adults consume almost 40% of all cigarettes smoked by adults. Um, the data on this slide comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 2013. Population surveyed with adults 18 and older reporting any mental illness in the past year. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's National Survey on Drug Use and Health defines mental illness as diagnosable mental behavior or emotional disorder and defines substance use disorder as dependence or abuse of alcohol or drugs. Approximately 43.8% of adults with any mental illness reported current use of tobacco in 2013 compared to 25.3% of adults with no mental illness. 
The data on this slide also comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health from 2013. This population surveyed is persons aged 26 years old reporting smoking drug and or alcohol use in the past 30 days. People with mental illness or substance use disorders die about five years or earlier than those without these disorders. Many of these deaths are caused by smoking cigarettes. The most common cause of death among people with mental illness are heart disease, cancer, and lung disease, which can all be caused by smoking. Drug users who smoke cigarettes are four times more likely to die prematurely than those who don't smoke. This is because nicotine has mood-altering effects that can temporarily mask the negative symptoms of mental illness, putting people with mental illness at higher risk for cigarette use and nicotine addiction. Lastly, people with mental illness are most likely to have stressful living conditions, have low annual household income, and lack access to health insurance, health care, and health quitting. Therefore, all of these factors make it more challenging to quit. One product that the FDA does not approve for quitting smoking is e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes produce an aerosol by heating a liquid that usually contains nicotine and other chemicals. Users inhale this aerosol into their lungs, and also bystanders can also breathe in this aerosol when user exhales into the ear into the air. A recent CDC study found that many adults are using e-cigarettes in an attempt to quit smoking. However, most adult e-cigarette users do not stop smoking cigarettes and are instead continuing to using both products. Because smoking even a few cigarettes a day can be dangerous, quitting smoking completely is very important to your health. So now we're going to identify strategies for motivating, motivating patients to quit and the role of their care team in tobacco cessation. Clinicians have an important role to play in helping their patients to stop smoking. The systemic identification of all smokers is the initial step in addressing smoking cessation. It's important to ask every patient at every visit whether they use tobacco. If yes, ask what type of tobacco, how often they smoke, and how long, and document the patient's answers in their medical chart. Next is counseling and support. It is important to use open-ended questions that begin with words like what, how, and when, and have that conversation about previous quitting experiences by highlighting successes, triggers, and also challenges. Next, the use of first-line nicotine replacement pharmacotherapy can increase quit, quit rates by 1.5 to 3-fold. Nicotine repl replacement therapy is a safe and not addictive way to relieve cravings and deliver low doses of nicotine without the harmful toxins in cigarettes. Some nicotine replacement therapies include nicotine gum, nicotine nozzle spray, nicotine patch, and more. Lastly is promoting whole care team involvement. So while multiple care team members should be involved, clearly identifying staff roles and responsibilities related to tobacco management is important to ensure timely and clear communication with patients. Now I'm going to turn it over to Julie to go over motivational interviewing for tobacco cessation. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. Um, so now that we've talked about some background information on tobacco use and how important it is to engage the entire care team when talking with patients, we're going to go through some motivational interviewing techniques and how to incorporate these strategies into counseling to encourage patients to quit. So first, what is motivational interviewing, or MI? This is a method of counseling that's really rooted in the principles on this slide. So first, showing empathy using reflective listening. And we'll talk more about how to do this in just a little bit. Then developing discrepancy. So showing the patient the gap between their goals and what they want to be able to do and also their current behavior, which here is an unhealthy habit um, that could stand in the way of those goals. 
then talking and sharing a different viewpoint without arguing or being too confrontational. So the goal here is to get the patient to see the other side without putting them on the defensive or having them shut down. Then adjusting or rolling with resistance instead of directly opposing it. So again, presenting another view that may not be in agreement with the patient, but in a way that leaves the door open for further discussion instead of slamming that door shut. And then supporting self-efficacy and optimism. So we'll talk about this one a little bit more um, in a bit too, but being encouraging about small steps and accomplishments that really build their confidence to eventually make bigger changes. Um, including tobacco is current, is definitely a huge change, so really just setting them up for success. So how is MI or motivational interviewing used as a counseling style? Um, so we have our principles, and then MI is also based on some baseline assumptions. So those are summarized on this slide here. First, uncertainty about substance use and possible change that lifestyle habit is normal. And it's an obstacle that patients are going to grapple with every step of the way um, while trying to quit. So we can work towards resolving this uncertainty by focusing on patients' motivations, their values, and goals. So putting an emphasis here is going to highlight how tobacco use comes into play and how it's likely getting in the way of achieving these things. The relationship, the relationship that you have with your patient is a partnership. So you both have expertise here. You have the clinical and maybe anecdotal knowledge um, of the impact of tobacco use. And then the patient is bringing to the table the expertise on their own mind, their lifestyle, and what's ultimately going to encourage them to change. And an empathetic and supportive counseling style combined with a direct and personalized message is quite a bit to set up conditions for behavior to change and begin. So now we're going to talk through a couple of models for tobacco cessation counseling that incorporate MI principles. So the first one on this slide here is the AAR model, or Ask, Advise, Refer. In the first step, like Paige mentioned earlier, um, you're going to be asking every patient at each encounter about their tobacco use and then documenting this. So for those that are current smokers, this is going to give you your pool of patients to engage with these strategies. And then as they move from the current to former, former smoker list, this is what's going to tell you if your interve intervention is effective. So next, advise current tobacco users to quit using a clear message that's strong and based on evidence while also being personalized to that patient. And this is where our MI principles are really going to come in, using their goals um, for their health and their future, and also any comorbidities, so any conditions that they have where tobacco can aggravate this condition or make it worse. Have a conversation about how tobacco use can ultimately stand in their way, and this is going to make them feel more engaged on a personal level. And then finally, refer patients who are ready or considering to quit tobacco to resources. Um, like Paige mentioned, um, are they interested in using a certain type of nicotine replacement therapy? Maybe they're looking for help in setting a quit date or creating a plan. And we're going to talk through some of the resources um, at the end and some of these resources that patients can actually use from the comfort of their own home. And then just as a note on this slide too, not all of these elements have to be delivered by just one person. So for example, a medical assistant might ask about smoking status while grooming a patient and then the physician may advise and refer or maybe care coordinators or community health workers may also refer the patient to local services. So definitely take advantage of a whole care team approach here. Over the next few slides, we're going to talk through the five A's model for tobacco cessation counseling using motivational interviewing, which is kind of like the AAR model, but it's just expanded. So just to summarize, the five A's are ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. So our first step here on this slide is ask. So again, ask every patient at every visit about tobacco use and then document their status. So we've mentioned this a few times, but it's so important for maintaining updated information about a patient's use or quit status. Using the five A's model, it's always important to ask the patient's permission to speak to them about their smoking and tobacco use status, um, because this shows that you have a respect for them and that you value their input as part of the team. If the patient refuses to give permission or simply says, no thanks, um, accept this and thank them for their time and move on to the next part of their visit. If they do grant permission, you can then proceed with the questions about their smoking or tobacco use. And we've included a couple of example questions on this slide to get the conversation going. So is it okay if I ask you about your smoking status? Um, do you currently use any type of tobacco products? 
And then do you mind if we talk more about your smoking today? So I know Paige talked before too about using open-ended questions and focusing on these to really encourage um, conversations. But this group of questions is really going to get you the initial yes, no that you're looking for. And then if, you're, if their answer to that second question is a yes, go ahead and proceed to the next step, which is advice. So advise every patient about the benefits of quitting tobacco use. So same as the AAR model, um, with a message that's easy to understand, strong and evidence-based, and then also personalized to them. So engaging the patient in conversation about his or her tobacco or smoking use can help create discrepancy. And again, that's the difference between where they are right now and where they see themselves in the future, hopefully tobacco-free. Really getting the patient to begin to see that behavior change would benefit them. In this step, use a cons and pros, pros approach. Um, focusing on the cons first, or the concerns that the patient has about their smoking, like in the first example question. Most patients aren't going to have a problem identifying the pros of continuing smoking or tobacco use, so again, um, focus on the cons and bring those up first. Then use something like the second example question. So, may I tell you what concerns I have about your smoking or tobacco use? Use that to continue conversation from your perspective using your expertise. And then after talking about the cons um, of continuing tobacco use, let the patient know that there are resources available to help them quit and they're not alone in starting and moving through this process. So next is assess. So assess the patient's readiness to change. And we're going to talk about identifying where patients are in this process in just a little bit. So you can begin to assess the patient's readiness by actively listening and paraphrasing without challenging or arguing um, using, the, some, using some of the questions listed on this slide. So how would your life be different without tobacco use? Really get them thinking about what behavior change would do for them. What do you see as the cons and pros of tobacco use? What is your biggest fear about quitting? And then also their fears about not quitting. And how confident are you that you could attempt to quit? It's also okay to ask the patient something like, what are you willing to do today about your, your, about your tobacco use? Um, to gauge where they are and then also get them thinking. And don't be discouraged if it doesn't seem like there's going to be any movement on the patient's part at this time. Again, just roll with, roll with resistance um, and avoid challenging the patient for not selecting the plan that you might believe is best. In this step, um, even if the patient isn't willing to go any further, summarize what you've discussed so far using paraphrasing to remind the patient about the cons associated with smoking and tobacco use. So next is assist. Assist those patients who are ready or considering change to make a quit plan. At this point, if the patient is open to quitting or thinking about it, share resources that you have available that can assist them in moving forward with their plan. And just as a recommendation, um, try to have these resources readily available to give to the patients and then also keep resources in places at the office where all staff can access them. Ask the patient what support they feel would help them quit which can include things like nicotine replacement therapies, maybe picking out a specific quit date, uh, types of counseling and social support. Developing and agreeing on a plan is really going to help us at this point. Even if the plan doesn't include quitting completely, you and the patient can set up a plan to cut down on the amount, of, uh, on the amount that they are using or the frequency of their tobacco use. And remember here that every step in the direction of change is going to be positive. If you get to this step and the patient is not willing to make any changes, you can still ask for permission um, to provide them with those materials and then thank them for their honesty, summarize what you've discussed and agreed upon, and then remind them that you and the rest of the care team are there to support them if they'd like to consider it in the future. The last step in the five A's model is arrange. So connect patients who are ready to resources and schedule follow-up appointments to touch base about their quit plan. So something that can help during this step is also developing a protocol to use in the office um, to decide how patients are going to be followed up with. So this should address things like who's responsible for calling those patients back, when should they be seen again, um, and also how. So are you looking to talk with them again in person, or could you touch base with them over the phone or maybe utilizing the patient portal for messaging? And also what information do you want to cover with them during this touch base? So also keep in mind the timing of the patient's quit plan. If they still seem a little unsure about creating their quit plan, try to see them back a little bit sooner to touch base. The majority of relapse occurs within the first two weeks of quitting, so just kind of another point to keep in mind for scheduling follow-up. 
So looking at our example questions on this slide, we want to review available resources. So the quit line, nicotine replacement therapy, and then any support groups that may be available to them. Ask the patient what quit method they prefer. If they don't have a preference, you can make suggestions. So for example, like Paige mentioned, nicotine replacement therapies can help relieve the craving symptoms and support their overall quit attempt. So if it's appropriate in their case, maybe suggest using one of these. So assessing patient readiness. Um, in the third step in our 5A's model, we were asking questions to assess patient's readiness to change. So in the next few slides, we're going to walk through how to identify where patients are falling on this spectrum. So in the stages of change, first comes pre-contemplation. So in this stage, people are not intending to take any action in the foreseeable future. So we're defining that as roughly about six months from now. They might not be aware that their behavior is problematic or that it produces negative consequences. In this stage, patients also um, underestimate the pros of changing behavior, and they tend to put a lot of emphasis on the cons. So for patients in this stage, just like we talked about before, we want to use our MI strategy to create awareness around the issue and then encourage them to think about tobacco use compared to their goals and create that dissonance. In the contemplation stage, people intend to begin behavior change in the foreseeable future, so they're thinking about changing that habit within the next six months. They recognize that their behavior may be problematic, and they're starting to actually consider those pros and cons in a thoughtful and practical way. Even with this recognition, though, people still may have mixed feelings about changing their behavior. So in this stage, talk with patients about your mutual concerns and let them know that there are resources available to help. And then the next stage is preparation, and this one is also known as determination. So in this stage, people are ready to take action in the near future. So these are people that are thinking about making a change within the next month or so. They can start to take small steps towards the behavior change, and they believe that changing their behavior is going to lead to a healthier life for them. In this stage, focus on education to reinforce their motivation and help them determine a quick plan with their chosen resources. Next is action. So in this stage, people have recently changed their behavior. So these are people who are making changes within about the last six months, and they intend to keep moving forward with these changes. They have hopefully quit or at least reduced their tobacco use, and they also have started new or healthy behaviors. This is a great place for patients to be, and in this stage, it's important to keep the conversation going about how modifying their behavior will ultimately help them reach their goals. Next is the maintenance stage. So in this stage, people have sustained their behavior change, and they intend to maintain the change going forward. So here, again, it's important to keep the conversation open. Ask them what's working and what might not be. Ask them about possible triggers. So do they notice anything in their lifestyle where it makes them want to start using tobacco again? And then also talk about ways to prevent relapse to earlier stages. Then comes termination. So in this stage, people don't desire to return to their unhealthy behaviors, and they feel sure that they're not going to relapse. So while this stage is possible, it's a little bit more rare. Most people tend to stay in the maintenance stage. So with termination of tobacco use is ultimately where we want to get our patients. And then also included in this model is relapse. Um, it's not on the slide, but this is a return to the unhealthy behavior after a period of success. And this is especially going to be relevant when we're talking about tobacco patients. So there are a number of variables that can contribute to relapse for tobacco use. So some of these might include social influences, like who they spend their time with, so friends, family, coworkers. If these people in their lives are also using tobacco, that's going to be kind of a barrier for those patients to quit. Also conditioned responses to their environment. So maybe they notice that when they are using alcohol, they are also tending to use tobacco as well, or maybe during certain social events. Um, or maybe they have a lack of unhealthy alternatives to occupy their time and focus, um, like regular exercise or hobbies. And then cravings also come into play. Um, they're going to notice that they miss the way that they feel while using tobacco. So again, be mindful of these things and talk with patients about how relapse is normal and help them prevent it by having an honest conversation about what triggers are in their life. So on this next slide, we have the stages of change kind of displayed as a visual map. So when we look at the stages this way, it actually looks less like a linear progression and more like a cycle. In the context of putting tobacco use, patients are going to enter the cycle at pre-contemplation. 
But by the time they get to you, they may already be in determination, action, or maybe they're, they've already relapsed. The idea is to understand where patients are in the decision-making process and then apply appropriate motivational interviewing strategies to encourage conversation and change. At the bottom of the graphic on this slide, you're going to see arrows showing that people can exit and re-enter the cycle at any stage. And thinking about lifestyle change like tobacco cessation, um, this may be around action and relapse. So again, it's important to talk with patients about relapse as it does happen because it's normal. Not necessarily giving them the green light to stop trying, um, but encouraging them to learn from each relapse and then try again. On this slide, it's just another representation of the stages. Again, this is showing that it's not linear and also kind of showing an increasing um, motivation and momentum as patients progress towards action and maintenance. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Paige, and she's going to give you some other strategies you can use in your practice to promote tobacco use management. Thanks, Julie. Now we are going to take a look at strategies for making tobacco management a priority in your practice. So one strategy that can be used in your practice is to develop a protocol for how tobacco users will be tracked and managed. Another strategy is the utilization of PDSA or Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle for improvement. Um, so this includes choosing an intervention and a plan for how you will measure it, implement the intervention, look at data, and refine the change you made based on what you learned. Another strategy is the utilization of the EMR. This can be done by clinical decision support alerts based on tobacco use status entered in the system, follow up with patients who are current smokers without a visit in the past three to six months, Offer support and answer questions to the patient portal, and track the tobacco use quality measure. Now let's take a look at some resources. One recommended resource is the CDC's Tips from, Smoker, from Former Smokers Campaign. Um, they offer stories from real people living with serious long-term health effects from smoking and secondhand smoke exposure. It is shown that hard-hitting media campaigns have been proven to, wear, to raise awareness about the dangers of smoking and to motivate smokers to quit. They also provide free videos, podcasts, and more. Another resource is your state's health department. They provide provider and patient-facing resources to support tobacco use management and quit attempts along with current statewide news and legislation related to smoking, tobacco marketing, and tobacco retail. Now, we all know that many offices don't have 24-7 time and resources to assist patients with quitting. So a referral to a quit line, such as the Michigan Tobacco Quit Line, is a good option for offices and patients that can access assistance from their own home. Your patients will have access to online coaching, nicotine replacement therapy, and also a membership to online communities. Also, the Community Preventative Services Task Force recommends split line interventions, especially proactive split lines, based on strong evidence of effectiveness in increasing tobacco cessation among clients interested in quitting. Evidence was considered strong based on findings from 60 trials of proactive telephone counseling when provided along or in combination with additional interventions. Minnesota also offers similar assistance to the Quit Line Plan. The Quit Plan includes coaching calls, free patches and gum, Quit Guide, and also an email program. Wisconsin's Tobacco Quit Line offers coaching, medications to help smokers quit, and an online forum for patients to access. It is also shown that smokers who use the Quit Line are four times more likely to quit than if they try to quit on their own. And also the quit line has fielded more than 250 calls, I'm sorry, 250,000 calls since 2001.
So who qualifies for quit lines? So patients who qualify for counseling to the tobacco quit lines include Medicaid patients, veterans, uninsured, patients with a cancer diagnosis, pregnant women, and also youth aged 13 through 17. Um, I do want to note that most people with private insurances are not eligible for quit line services. Though anyone can call the quit line, they will just ask about insurance and direct callers to appropriate resources from there. But pregnant women, those with a diagnosis of cancer and youth are eligible for the quit line regardless of insurance status. So referring patients to the quit line just takes a few minutes. Um, you can refer a patient by the provider web referral. Um, there's an e-referral that utilizes your EMR system, and also you can fax a referral form in for your patient. All right, so at this time, I think we would like to open the line for any questions. It looks like we do already have one in chat. Do um, so have a question from Beth? Um, can we have access to this recorded webinar after this session? I would love to share this with my students. Well, thank you for your interest, and today's slides are going to be available on the Lake Superior Quinn YouTube page within about the next week. Um, so also at this time, while we're waiting for any additional questions to come in, we're going to go ahead and pull up our polling questions. Um, so if you can, please take a minute to work through these questions. We use your feedback when we're structuring our future learning sessions. So at this time, are there any other questions from participants? Operator, can you open the line for questions? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. If you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. We are waiting for callers to join the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the number one key on your telephone keypad. Still waiting for callers to join the queue. There are no questions at this time. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, very much for joining us today for our tobacco dissipation counseling training. And as a reminder, the slides are going to be available on the Lake Superior Expansion YouTube page within about the next week. Thank you very much, and have a great day, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes your conference. You may disconnect at this time.